providing us with his insights into uh, the economic environment and um, the investment markets. Uh, I'm sure everyone will agree that the topic is particularly important given the rising interest rate environment and inflation and the effects on investments and your portfolios. Um, to introduce Roger, um, Roger's been here a couple of times. You may remember him. Um, he's the founder and chief uh, investment officer at uh, Montgomery Investment Management. Uh, he's a renowned investor for 30 years in the industry. Um, he's a successful uh, public company chairman, analyst, um, and he also wrote the book Value Able uh, back in 2010, and it was a bestseller um, on, the, on the book sites. Um, Roger also appears on ABC and Os Osby's uh, channel TV. Can we please give a warm welcome to Roger? Well, hi everyone, how are you? Thank you for putting on such great weather for me. Um, coming down from Sydney, the, uh, the pilot said it's going to be 15 degrees today, uh, raining and uh, windy from the south. And then I remembered all the reasons why I left Melbourne and moved to Sydney. Um, uh, all three in one. I'm going to, it's going to be a broad ranging um, talk today. I'm going to be talking a little bit about our business. Um, I'm going to be talking a little bit about um, frameworks for investing and I'm going to talk about conditions in the market at the moment and also in the economy. It's really important that you in ask me questions throughout the presentation, don't wait until the end. Um, because the topics are so broad ranging, you may end up forgetting what your question was if you hold on to it until the end of the presentation. Um, and the other reason why, and many of you already know this, but the other reason why I encourage people uh, to ask questions throughout is that there was some scientists back in the US in the 19, late 80s, I think it was, actually determined through some research that attendees to workshops and seminars absorb and retain more information if they're awake. <laughs> and so if you're asking questions throughout the presentation, you won't nod off. Now I know some of you have heard that joke before, so forgive me for using it again. Um, okay, so there was a disclaimer which I p passed over momentarily. I'm going to be talking about some stocks today. Please don't rush out and buy them, although I'd love you to because we own them in many cases. That would be very helpful to us. Um, see your advisor uh, before doing anything in security markets. Okay. Um, so, starting off, we're going to talk about uh, Montgomery and how Montgomery has transformed recently. I'll then give you a framework that should, if you absorb it in one go, which would be remarkable, but I'm hoping you will, uh, you'll be able to take that with you through anything that the market throws at you in the future. Um, and you'll see it applied today. It's a framework for thinking about whether now's a good time to invest. Um, and then what I'll do is I'll, I'll give you my opinion about what I think is going to happen next. And opinions, as many of you have heard, are a little bit like bottoms. Everyone has one. Um, and mine is probably as valuable as anyone else's. I am no good at predicting what's going to happen next. No one in this room is going to be able to do it accurately. But what I'll do is I'll give you an educated insight into what I think the things are that are going to be, or the influences are, that are going to move markets next year. Now the executive summary is this, I think next year will be quite a good year. And I think all the tough talk about interest rates will continue. Interest rates will be higher than people expect and they'll stay up longer than people expect. But on the other side, balance sheets, central bank balance sheets will be manipulated to support markets and support economies. And I'll explain the evidence that we've seen already of that occurring uh, in the presentation. Okay, so going back to the transformation of Montgomery. Montgomery, we started the firm, or I started the firm uh, back in 2010 <coughs> with one fund, the Montgomery Private Fund. Uh, we have since expanded to become a house of partnerships and we've partnered with a number of different groups to bring a range of different products. And I won't spend too much time on this because a lot of the products aren't on platforms that you can invest through anyway and it's really up to your advisor to decide what you invest in. But I just want to describe how Montgomery has changed. The first partnership that we set up was with Gary Rollo and Dominic Rose, uh, and we set up Montgomery Lucid, it's a 50-50 joint venture, and they delivered the Montgomery Small Companies Fund. They did so well out of the blocks 
uh, that uh, we, it really gave us an appetite for partnerships. And in this modern world, what we find is a lot of people in our industry just don't want to be employees. If they're going to set up a fund, they want to be in a partnership or a joint venture or some sort of uh, reciprocal arrangement in terms of revenue share and profit share and cost sharing. Um, our next partnership was with Poland Capital. And the guys at Poland, they're based in Boca Raton in Florida. They also have offices in Boston, in London, and now in Hong Kong. Uh, and they deliver, uh, they've got about 83 billion US dollars under, under management. Uh, and we are the exclusive distributors of their global funds in Australia. So we uh, provide access to a global growth fund. And their flagship fund, which is their US-based growth fund, it's been running for over 30 years, it's been running for 33 years, and they've generated about 15% per annum for 33 years. So when someone tells you fund managers can't beat the market, just ask them about Poland. So what about these guys? They've been doing it for over three decades. Um, uh, they also, uh, we also distribute the small companies fund. So global small companies are not unlike Australian small companies. They tend to be a bit bigger though and they have a global footprint or they have a global runway for growth. Um, so some of the businesses that that fund owns, you might have heard of, does anyone like gin and tonic? Does anyone like a g and There's some people there rolling their eyes going too much. I like it too much. Um, uh, well, Fever Tree Tonic, you know Fever Tree? Um, which is sort of, sort of side, so stepped over Schweppes uh, as a tonic provider or, or some of the other brands. Um, they own Fever Tree. Fever Tree is a London-based company. It's about 15 years old. Um, they own it in the small companies fund. Those of you who are into your outdoor sports, uh, if you've got roof racks on your car, you might have Thule, uh, T-H-U-L-E, Thule um, or Thule, um, roof racks and boxes for skis and bike racks and so on. They own that as well. Um, it's, it dominates the market for that product in about 127 countries. I think there's only 140, so they're doing pretty well. Um, so they own that in the small companies fund. And next year we plan on launching an emerging markets fund. The next partnership, completely different to equities, is with Brett Craig. Brett Craig worked uh, for 11 years at uh, Macquarie Group, uh, and he basically headed up their uh, small business uh, lending and securitization of small business loans, uh, medium-sized business loans at Macquarie. Uh, and then he uh, left Macquarie to set up the Aura Credit, a business called Aura Credit Holdings within the Aura Group, and he runs the Aura High Yield SME Fund. I'll talk to you about that uh, in just a moment. And we've also just launched the Aura Core Income Fund. And our final partnership uh, is different again, and it's with Sean and Alan and the team at, at uh, Australian Eagle. Basically, my responsibility is to deliver the best returns I can possibly deliver to our clients, and that's either doing it through a partnership or doing it directly. Sean and Alan have been running Australian Eagle for 17 years. They are in the top 2% of managers in Australia in terms of their performance over that 17-year period. They were doing a much better job than me and my team, so I made my team redundant and we brought these guys in. So I got rid of three and we brought in six. So I got rid of three people on my team and Alan and Sean and Dan work in our offices in Castle Ray Street in Sydney. Uh, and uh, that's our most recent partnership. They run the Montgomery Fund now and they also run the Montgomery Private Fund with me alongside them. Now you won't, these numbers might be a little bit small up the back, but this is Brett's uh, wholesale fund uh, which is the Aura High Yield SME Fund. Now, let me take a step back before I tell you what the returns are. What he does is he has seven originators. Originators are people who, who are businesses who go out and uh, take loan applications and write loans. So they receive the applications, process the applications, assess the applications, and if the risk is appropriate, lend money to small and medium sized enterprises. So one of their biggest groups that they lend to is the agricultural space. So there might be a farmer with a $2 million crop uh, that he has to get off the land in the next couple of weeks, otherwise it's going to be terrible, not going to be able to get the wheat off, it'll be feed grain for example, or feed wheat, uh, but his head is broken. Needs $100,000 uh, and needs it now. Uh, the problem is if that farmer approaches a bank, the bank will take six to eight weeks to approve the loan, 
he can get the money through uh, an online originator in 24 to 48 hours through one of the seven originators that Brett uses to lend the money out from this particular fund. The average size of the loan uh, will be uh, about $140,000. Oh, sorry? 20. It's 20 now. Oh, with the new 7,000. Yeah, okay. Um, so the average size of the loan is $20,000 uh, and uh, the average term is about four months. The interest rate is somewhere between 12 and 15%. But the farmer who's got the crop to get off, it's a $2 million crop, he's only borrowing the money for two months or three months. So it's only going to cost him two or $3,000 to borrow that money, fix the header and get the crop off. The alternative is, loses a $2 million crop. So that's just one example. Another example that they'll lend up to 95% for will be a farmer, because we've had all this rain right around Australia, lots of property owners have a lot of grass, but they may not have cattle. And cattle will be something that they'll lend up to 95% on, these originators, simply because the value of the cattle goes up as the cattle get fatter and as they're fed. And so the LVR, the loan ratio, goes down with every passing day as the cattle feed. So they'll lend to farmers in those situations. So through that fund, through that fund, providing those loans, many thousands of small loans over a short period of time. And remember, I should say, or not remember, but I should let you know that the gap between what small and medium enterprises in Australia would like to borrow and what the banks, the big four banks, are actually providing them, that gap at the moment, as of last month, is about $96 billion. <coughs> so there's an enormous market waiting to be tapped, an enormous business opportunity for originators and also for these types of what we call private credit funds. <coughs> this fund started back in 2017, 2018, uh, uh, August 2017. So it's been going now for a good five years uh, plus. Uh, and um, uh, what you can see there is on a million dollars, the cash, so the monthly return, the monthly cash return, and the total for the year. So you can see the first year was 9.8%, 10.2%, 8.8%, 8.7%, and 8%. And it's actually starting to pick up again. The yield is starting to pick up. Because the term of the loan is so short in the portfolio, it's about four months, then when interest rates go up, that book is repriced again at a higher interest rate. So it's like a floating rate of interest. Anyway, so we partnered with Brett recently uh, on this fund and uh, very in our very early negotiations about partnering, I said to Brett, I said, look, this is all well and good, but a lot of people will think that you know, a 9% return or a 10% return is very risky. So what we need to do is have a fund that offers a, a lower return and that's higher up the capital stack, so it's more secure, and that's the core income fund. But at the moment, that's not available to you through your advisors. It's still going through the motions of getting rated, uh, being approved, and going on platforms. Okay, that's a, not a slide that I expected to see. Something's just happened. Um, does anyone have any idea? <laughs> I think something's been reset while I was talking. A font. Oh, there we go. Thank you so much. All right, we can tap through now. Okay. The Australian Eagle team, the guys managing the fund that you're invested in, the Montgomery Fund. As I said, they've been going for 17 years, just over 17 years now. And so good are their returns, and this is the reason why we've employed them to manage the fund, alongside me and the private fund, um, is that over every time frame they've outperformed. Again, just like Poland outperforming over 33 years, they've done a phenomenal job uh, of outperforming, uh, and so we're obviously really impressed with that track record. It's a darn sight better than most other fund managers in Australia, and I'm really pleased that we've, we've got them on board to work for you. Okay, so we're going to take a different route now, different direction. It's really, really, if, if not difficult, impossible to know what's going to happen in markets next. And often our emotions get in the way when we're thinking about investing. And the time to invest is usually, and you know this historically, you know you've seen it before, the time, as Warren Buffett said, to be greedy 
is when everyone else is fearful. When the day is darkest and it's gloomiest and you think it's not going to ever get better again, that's precisely the moment you want to be investing. But it's really, really difficult to do. So I hope that this framework will actually give you some, uh, some solid reason to invest when the day is darkest, to invest when it seems miserable. Um, I'm hoping that you'll see a logical and rational reason for biting the bullet, pulling the trigger, whatever you want to call it, and investing and diving in at that time. So we're going to start with a table that demonstrates an interesting observation that links an observation between your return and the uh, earnings growth rate of a company. So what we're going to do is we're going to buy a share of a company for $100, and that $100 is 10 times the earnings of the company. So the earnings per share is $10. We're going to pay a PE ratio. Oh, it's sensitive, isn't it? It's what touch, do I need to do touch to screen. Just, um, just touch the screen. Touch the screen. Touch the screen yeah? yep. Okay, I won't do that Don't again. Don't touch <laughs> <laughs> um, Okay, so we're going to pay... a a price to earnings multiple of 10 times the earnings of $10, and that's a share price of $100. So that's an outflow from our bank account. We've paid $100 for those shares. Now, what we're also going to do is we're going to hold the shares for the next four years, and the shares, the earnings are going to grow by 10% every year. So they go from $10 to 11 then $12, 10 13 31 and so on. Now, here's the interesting thing. In the fifth year, we're going to sell the shares for 10 times the earnings of $14.64, uh, and we're going to receive $146.41. There are only two cash flows. Outflow of 100, inflow of 146, four years later in the fifth year. That internal rate of return from those cash flows over that period of time is 10%. Now, what you'll notice is the 10% is equal to the earnings growth rate of the company. Why? Because we bought and sold the shares on the same PE ratio. The popularity of the stock never changed. It was unpopular when we bought it at 10 times earnings, and it was unpopular when we sold it because it was still only 10 times the earnings. A popular stock would be 30 times the earnings or 25 times, or 40 times. And last year we saw some companies that didn't even make a profit, and they, they were trading in an infinite PE ratio because the earnings were zero or negative. So what we're saying here is if you buy and sell a company's shares on the same popularity, PE ratio, a PE is the multiple of earnings the market or people are willing to pay. If you buy and sell them on the same PE, your return will equal the earnings growth rate of the company. Now, that tells you something important. You should be buying companies, good quality businesses that are growing. You want to be buying businesses whose earnings are going up every year because your return will equal that growth rate. You want to buy businesses whose earnings are going to grow fast and continue growing fast for a long time because that will generate a return for you that's equivalent if the PEs are the same. The other thing you want to do is you want to buy when they're unpopular because they might not be popular in the future either. Now, I'm going to demonstrate that this is not the case, that they will become popular again, particularly if they're growing at 10% per year or more. In the next example, everything is exactly the same, except this time it's 20 times the earnings. So you see we bought and sold on 20 times the earnings. Now, this might be more nail-biting for us because... At 20 times, it could go to 10. You know, it could drop by half. Um, this is starting to be a little bit more popular for a company that's growing at the same rate as the first company. They're both growing at 10% a year, but this one, you're paying more for it. The way to think about a PE ratio, just as an aside, is to say, okay, well, if I pay 20 times the earnings, at the current rate of earnings, it's going to take me 20 years to be paid back for my investment. You'd rather buy something at 10 times the earnings because it'll only take 10 years for you to be paid back, assuming the earnings don't grow. That's at the current earnings of $10. So here we buy and sell on the same PE ratio. The earnings grow by 10% per year. And guess what? Our internal rate of return is 10%, the same as the earnings growth rate. But look what happens if we buy today 
when the market generally isn't very popular, stocks aren't very popular. In fact, earlier this year, only a month or two ago, I hadn't seen PE so low in a very long time. I hadn't seen sentiment so gloomy uh, for, for many years. And uh, here we're going to buy it 15 times. The shares grow, we've, we've picked a great company. It's growing its earnings at 20% per year. But what happens at some point in the next five years, and we'll just use the fifth year in this example, the stock market becomes popular again. And the multiple goes from 15 to 20. So we bought on 15 and we're selling for 20 times the earnings because the stock market has become popular again. We bought when it was less popular, like today, and over the next five years, it becomes popular again, and we sell it. The result is not a 20% return. We would have received a 20% return if we bought at 15 and sold at 15 times, but we're selling at 20 times. Our return is not 20% per annum, but 29% per annum. So wouldn't it be great if it was that easy? You could just buy companies on 15 times, just find the ones that are growing at you know, 20% per year for the next five years, and then wait for the stock market to be more popular, sell it and you'll make 30% per annum or 29% per annum. Clearly there's work involved. And that's the work that the Poland team does. That's what Sean and Alan do. Finding those companies, and Gary and Dom in the small caps fund, finding the companies that are growing, not at 5% a year, but at 15 and 20 and 30% per annum. That is precisely what they spend all their time doing. Finding the companies that are gonna generate these numbers. And what I'm here to tell you is, if we can find companies that are generating these numbers and we buy them when the market is unpopular, then we're going to do very, very well. And that's what I want you to take away from this framework idea. I'll show you where we are in just a moment in terms of PE ratios. Warren Buffett said this many, many years ago. He said, your goal as an investor is simply to purchase at a rational price a part share of an easy to understand business whose earnings are virtually certain to be materially higher in 5, 10, 20 years from now. He went on to say, put together a portfolio of businesses whose earnings march upward over the years and so will the market value of the portfolio. Here's the interesting thing. Growth stocks, companies that are growing, have been hit the hardest in the sell-off this year. They've been the stocks where the PE has compressed the most. The companies that had any whiff of growth about them were sold off the most. And yet they're the ones that people like Warren Buffett have said you should be buying. They became the cheapest. And that's why this framework is so valuable right now because it's telling you you should buy growth stocks when they're cheap. And right now, growth stocks have been cheap. Okay. Here are some of the companies that are in our portfolios, either in the global portfolios, in the small cap portfolio, or in the Montgomery Fund and the Montgomery Private Fund. We've got Cochlear, CSL, REA Group. I'm going to show you REA Group in a bit more detail shortly, and IDP Education as well. There's Fever Tree, I mentioned them a little bit earlier. We're going to talk a little bit about Adobe. We're not going to talk about Endava today, but Yeti, has anyone heard of Yeti? Has anyone heard of Yeti? Yep, seen their, seen their stuff around? So Yeti is, has a cult following in the United States. They're a US brand, a US company. They make eskies, what they call over there coolers. Um, and in, um, they call them something else in New Zealand. What do they call them in New Zealand? Chili bins. Chili bins, yeah. So that's what they make. But a, you know, a medium sized esky, is about 700 US dollars and they sell out every year and 95% of their revenue is in the United States. They're only just expanding overseas now. Why is Risky so expensive? Because they've got a cult following, people love the brand, they're high quality, they keep your food colder for longer, whatever. <laughs> Some of the $70 ones are funny. Mate, <laughs> mate, don't ruin a good story with that. <laughs> this is a good story. People yeah, pay up. People, hey, a lot of people drive Toyota Camrys and they, you know, the, the Lamborghini will get you there faster, and, but you're still going to get there. You know, and not a lot faster because the speed limit's the speed limit, but people still pay a lot more. Um, so 
Here's the interesting thing. I went out, so I, we met with the company, we've spoken to the company, we've been on their earnings calls and listened to them and we've talked to the Poland guys uh, about um, Rob Forker who runs the Global Small Companies Fund. Um, talked to him about Yeti, so we, we understand. And I'd heard about Yeti just from talking to them and about them, but I'd never seen their product. And then I remember Rob saying 95% of revenues are still US based. They're only just starting to expand overseas. Now I have a little farm in a town called Mount Beauty or Tawonga in Northeast Victoria. You know that road that's closed between Mount Beauty and Falls Creek? Well, it's very disappointing for me because that's where I ride my motorbike up uh, in the summertime. Um, and there's a little, at the bottom of uh, Falls Creek is the town of Mount Beauty and there's a post office. Uh, and the post office is now run by a guy who's basically shrunk the post office and expanded the footprint of adventure gear. Now, if, if that screen represented nowhere, then Mount Beauty is about there, <laughs> right? right in the middle. And yet you walk into the post office at Mount Beauty and there is an entire rack, a corner of the store devoted to what? Yeti products. <laughs> Extraordinary. A cult following in the US and now in a sort of an adventure outfitter's store in a tiny little town of Mount Beauty with a population of two and a half thousand people. You know, absolutely extraordinary. Um, so, you know, that's just, just beginning its story of growth. You know, it's generating phenomenal returns on equity. It's got little or no debt. It's growing at 15 to 20% per annum. And it's just, ex it's just started its overseas expansion. Where did they go first? Mount Beauty, because that's where I'd go if I was expanding a global brand. Um, okay, so that just shows you that they, you know, they, the, the people that they sell to really care about that product, they really care about that brand, and they're happy to pay up for it. Now, Buffett said, by companies growing their earnings strongly, all of these companies have been doing that, and you've got to buy at a rational price. And we just talked about a low PE ratio versus a high PE ratio. It's really hard to know what the right PE ratio is, except when you know it's really low. And how do you know it's really low? Well, you can go back through history and have a look at PE ratios. Now, over here on the left-hand side, I've got the S&P 400 mid-cap, the mid-cap stocks, and the S&P 600 small caps. And this is a plot going back to 1999, so the turn of the century, and looking at the PE ratio for those indices. One of the first things that you'll observe about these, these lines is that they go up and down a lot. Now, if PE ratios are a reflection of the popularity of the stock market, then what you can see is that the popularity frequently changes. As, as Ben Graham once said, you know, the market, Mr. Market, really does have some bipolar issues. You know, the, goes from extreme bouts of pessimism to extreme bouts of optimism in a relatively short period of time here. You know, we're talking 23 years. You know, and in between, it flicks around a lot. But the point I want to show you is in small cap land, at least at the moment, if you can just move your head around so that you can see where we are historically, you can see that you have to go back to the start of the century to find one or two other periods where sentiment towards small companies, even those that are growing fast, is this pessimistic. That's the GFC just here, and that's the COVID sell-off just there. And you can see that sentiment today is about as bad as it has ever been this century. Even the GFC only saw PE ratios slightly lower. Over here on the right-hand side, this is in the Australian market. This does only go back to um, just after uh, the COVID uh, interruption that we had to markets. But you can see PEs have collapsed, both one year forward PEs and two year forward price to earnings multiples. Sentiment is extremely negative in the market. Now, this month, the market's bounced. Mm. So PEs have come off their absolute lows, but no one is convinced at the moment that times are good. So historically speaking, price to earnings multiples or popularity is still at a low ebb. Now, ideally, we would have loved to have bought at the absolute bottom. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the fears that we have if we buy today, stocks might fall further. 
I'm going to talk about that in just a moment. But what I want to leave you with is the power of this framework and its applicability to today's market. It's a good framework for thinking about stocks right now because high quality growth stocks are still relatively unpopular going back through history. This table here requires a little bit of explanation. It basically extends the framework that I just described. Buying and selling stocks on the same PE, your return will be equal to the earnings growth rate of the company. It's just expanding on that. So let's take a company that we've decided to buy and it's growing at 15% per annum. So this is the earnings per share growth rate of the company and we're going to take the 15% row and if we go all the way across to the right hand side to the 0% column, that 0% represents zero change in the PE ratio between when we bought and when we sold. So if we bought on a PE of 10 and we sold on a PE of 10, then over five years, the PE has changed by 0%. Everyone with me on that? Okay. Now, what you'll notice is the return that we receive is 15%. That's the growth rate of the company's earnings, which is the table that I gave you earlier. If we buy a stock on a PE of 10, sell it on a PE of 10, and its earnings grow at 10% per annum, our return is 10%. It's the same here. If we buy a company, uh, buy it and sell it on the same PE ratio, so the PE doesn't change, it's growing its earnings at 15%, our return will be 15% from buying and selling the shares. Okay. Our biggest fear when we invest is that the market will go down as soon as we buy. It's called sequencing risk. It's horror, and you're right to be afraid of it because if you have a really bad year to begin with, you know, it's harder to work that loss back. It's harder to make that money back. Or it takes time. It's not harder, but it just takes longer. So our biggest fear is that we have a, you know, a 25% fall, for example, in the PE ratio. So if we bought on a PE of 10, then when we sell in five years' time, the PE might be seven and a half. Stock market could be even less popular than it is today. That's the worst outcome. And what this is showing is that if we buy a stock that is growing at 15% per annum and we sell it at a 25% lower PE than when we bought it in five years' time, we still make a 9% return on our money. In fact, the PE has to compress by 50% before we start even losing money. So we can take some comfort if we're buying companies that are growing at 15%, 20%, 25% per year, and that's where all the work is, of course, finding businesses that are growing at those rates. But if we can buy a business that's growing at 20% per annum, then even if, even if the PE compresses by a quarter in the next five years, we're still going to make 13% per annum. But what if it doesn't? What if the PE goes up? Because right now, historically, remember, PEs are at a low ebb. And we know, just look back at the chart, it's there right in front of you. We know that when PEs are low, they go back up again at some point. So is it likely, is it, sorry, is it possible that PEs compress by 25%? Yes. Is it probable? Probably not. It might happen in the short term. But over five years, do you believe the stock market will be popular again at some point in the next five years? This chart says definitely. This chart says PEs will go back up again at some point. And it sounds like sacrilege to even suggest it when times are so gloomy as they are now. But that's what this shows. The market is bipolar. It goes from extreme bouts of pessimism and it will eventually see extreme bouts of optimism again. In other words, looking at this small cap, we, we have to see a 25% decline in the PE ratio. That's this line going down to this level here. And we start losing money only if the PE drops by 50%. And that means this line, this blue line has to come off the chart. And of course it can't come off the chart because there's a, a line at the bottom there, that black line, that stops it from going any lower. <laughs> Clearly it doesn't. It could go lower. But historically, we have not seen that. Not in the last 
quarter of a century. Um, and I think the appetite for risk will come back before we see that. But that's where the PE for small caps would have to go in five years' time for you to lose money or start losing money if you bought a stock growing at 15% per annum. Any questions on that? No? Okay. Terrific. So where are we today? Well, central banks globally have been talking a very tough story on inflation. And they've been acting on that tough story. They've been raising interest rates, led by the US Federal Reserve, who's raised rates six times now and raised rates faster than everyone else. New Zealand's backed off, Canada's backed off, Australia's backed off a little bit. Um, but the US has been really gung-ho about raising interest rates and fighting inflation. But in the background this year, they started off playing a really tough game on another part, in another area of monetary policy. But more recently, they've actually eased off that tough stance. So central banks have two levers that they can pull in terms of monetary policy. It used to be just one, now it's two. So there's manipulating interest rates, the short end of the yield curve, changing interest rates, which is what they've been doing, but they can also buy and sell bonds and adjust the size of their balance sheet. And that's what they did after the GFC. They started quantitative easing after the global financial crisis, again, led by the US Federal Reserve. What do they do? Well, the US government has to fund its expenditure. How does it do that? It borrows money. How does it borrow money? It issues bonds. It issues US Treasury bonds, what the central bank does, the US Federal Reserve, is it buys those bonds from the government. And what does it pay? How does it buy those bonds? It pays cash. And it gives cash to the sellers of the bonds. That cash finds its way into the financial markets, into the, into the monetary system, and then into the economy. And so through quantitative easing after the global financial crisis, we avoided a depression. US short-term interest rates were brought down to zero during the financial crisis, and then long rates were brought down to zero as well, so the yield curve was flat. How did the US central bank bring, how did the bank bring long-term rates down to zero? They bought bonds, and they just kept buying them. And that lifted the bond price. Their buying pushed the price up, which pushes the yield down. And the yield was at zero, that zerp. That a policy called ZERP, zero interest rate policy. And that's what they did. Now, this uh, red line and black line, since the start of this year, represents global central bank balance sheets. When the US Federal Reserve buys bonds, it puts bonds on its balance sheet, its balance sheet expands, this line should go up. When they shrink the balance sheet, the bonds that they've already bought, they let them mature and they don't replace them. The balance sheet shrinks. These lines go down. What we know, and it's only a recent observation, which is why this is only going back to um, January, but we've seen it, we can back solve and we can see it going back further. What we know is that there's a very good correlation between stock market performance, this thin black line that you can see, and the red line, which is the US Federal Reserve's balance sheet. And what you can see is during the start of the from the start of the year, the US, the market, the stock market went down, the balance sheet was shrinking, and then around June, July, the US Federal Reserve started expanding its balance sheet again. It's, in other words, it started buying bonds again. And the market went up. Then they shrunk the balance sheet again, the market went down. So they're starting to work out. It's almost as though the US Central Bank is working out, hey, we've got power to support the stock market at the same time that we raise interest rates. We could be raising interest rates and expanding our balance sheet, and that will keep the stock market from crashing, which of course is a good thing because then there's the wealth effect. You know, you don't want a stock market crashing because people feel poorer and then they don't spend, they pull their heads in, they don't borrow money and the economy can collapse. There is a link between the asset market performance and economic performance. And so this is a really, really powerful observation. 
And I believe, and we saw it just last week, and we talked about this just before the seminar started today, um, uh, last week, global central banks expanded their balance sheets by 169 billion US dollars. So hang on a sec, I thought they were being really tough on inflation, being really tough talking, tough talk on interest rates. Yes, they are. But in the background, they're doing a, you know, those three cups, you know, when you, you land in Milan and you go and you want to lose money, you just go to one of those tables where they move the cups around and the ball's actually been dropped behind the table and you didn't see it, it was too quick. Um, that's what the central banks are doing. They're playing a game when they're saying, hey, really tough on interest rates. Interest rates are going up. We're fighting inflation. Put money in the market. Put money in the market. We're going to expand our balance sheet. We're going to support the economy and we're going to support markets. And that's what's been happening. Now, this chart over here on the left-hand side goes back to the GFC, the global financial crisis. And this is global in US dollars, trillions of US dollars. This is global central bank liquidity the balance sheet that I was talking about earlier. And you can see that since the GFC, the balance sheet has been expanding. But then this year, the balance sheet, oh, oh, I nearly touched it, um, the balance sheet started contracting again and our stock market collapsed. We had a crash in the stock market this year. But now what's happening is the pace of decline is starting to slow. And historically, there seems to be a cycle, the black line, with a representation of that cycle being the red line, there seems to be a cycle in the expansion and contraction of global central bank balance sheets. And it looks like we're getting very close to a low ebb for central bank balance sheet size. And some point this year or next year, and remember just this week, just gone last week, central banks, global central banks expanded their balance sheets by $169 billion. So it could be that interest rates, short-term interest rates, do keep going up, but at the same time, global central banks stop with quantitative tapering or quantitative tightening and revert back to quantitative easing. If that does happen, then you know, there's no other way of expressing it. We're probably off to the races again for the stock market next year, and it could be a really, really good year. Now, remember right at the start, I said, I'm no good at predicting. I don't know where the market's going to go and I don't know what's going to happen in the economy. I leave that to economists who make sheep look like independent thinkers. Um, and uh, they can predict all that stuff. My job is to give you an interpretation of what could happen. And there seems to be some evidence that this is... And what I like about this analysis is no one's talking about it in mainstream media. Everyone's talking about short-term interest rates and inflation. No one's talking about balance sheet uh, manipulation by central banks. So I think that's one that we should be watching. Sorry, just a question, if yes. I may. Go ahead. If the Reserve Bank buys bonds for cash, yes, there's no change to the balance sheet. It's just an asset swap. Except that the balance, except that the cash is not on the balance sheet. Well, where's the cash? It's printed. Never saw the balance sheet. Never got on the balance sheet. Mm. Okay. Okay, I have to stand here and I yeah, no, no. roll it out and it just goes out the door. It doesn't go onto the balance sheet. Yeah, yeah, okay. that's how. Um, and they did that um, you know, through the term funding facility. Yeah. And that's how we all, got, some of you got to borrow for four years at 1.98% you know, through the NAB. Anyway, if anyone borrowed uh, for a mortgage and fixed their rate or you know someone who did, uh, you, you were able to do that because our Reserve Bank of Australia did exactly this. Yeah. Okay, the other thing on the inflation story, there's some more optimism. The leading indicators for inflation are starting to roll over. So for example, um, if we look at uh, inventories, wholesale and retail inventory, then what we can actually see is we've, we've seen a, a huge spike in inventory at a, at, at a warehouse level and also at a, at a retail store level. Now why is that important? Well, it means that they've stocked up. They're not short product. And so the pressure on prices, uh, when you walk into a store and you say, I really like that car. Well, if you really want that car, you're going to have to pay big dollars because there's a two-year waiting list for that car. Oh, no, don't worry about it. I won't buy it. Or, yes, I will. I'll pay that higher price. Now, with inventory, you'll start to see prices go down. I wrote an article earlier this year in The Australian talking about second, the second-hand car market. We've all seen just how expensive second-hand cars became 
uh, during and after the pandemic. When new cars start to arrive in dealerships en masse and they're trickling in now, you'll see second-hand prices start to drop. I sold a, uh, a car that I had in Sydney that I had for four years. I wrote that article and then I sold my car. A dealer called me and offered me to pay me what I bought the car, what I paid for the car four years prior from the same dealer. There were only three of my cars available for sale at the time in March when I sold it. There are now 14 for sale. I'm really pleased I sold it, <laughs> okay, because I couldn't get the price, that price now. Um, and so these are significant. This is real, it's happening. Prices will start to come down. The other thing that we've seen is leading indicators um, that were uh, describing the pressure in the supply chain, the logistics issues, uh, the bottlenecks in the supply chain. They're also starting to roll over now. So we're seeing, for example, the deliveries index and backlog of orders. So days delivered is coming down. Backlog of orders coming down. So that tells you that, that the component of inflation that's related to supply, and not all of it's related to supply, some of it's related to wages, for example, <coughs> but the proportion of inflation related to supply and the bottlenecks in the supply chain are starting to ease. Those restrictions are starting to loosen, and that's good. So it's quite possible that next year we see disinflation. Now, what is disinflation? It's not deflation. Deflation is declining prices. And I'm not suggesting next year we'll see prices go down, but we'll see them rise at a slower rate. When you get consecutively lower rates of inflation, that's called disinflation. And what's really important to know about disinflation is that historically, and this chart goes back to 18, just before 1880, what's really important about disinflation, it is a good time to invest in the stock market. Disinflation is a great time to invest, particularly for growth, innovative growth companies. Since about the 1970s, uh, if you'd invested in disinflationary years, you'd have done really well. Now, what does this chart show? There's a blue line, there's a red line, and a black line. The, the red line is the S&P 500, the US S&P 500, going all the way back to just before 1880. The blue line is your return had you invested in the S&P 500 in the inflationary years only, just when there was inflation going up. So inflation was rising each year, expanding inflation. The black line is your return if you'd invested in the US S&P 500 in only the disinflationary years. So what you'll notice about the black line is it equals the red line, but you're only invested 50% of the time. So arguably, you could have halved your risk I mean, it's completely hypothetical because you don't know it's been a disinflationary year until after it's happened, <laughs> right? But historically, what this shows is that you will get the same return as the market, arguably with half the risk, by just investing in the disinflationary years. It's just demonstrating that investing when we have disinflation has been good. The other thing, so going back... So we're starting to see disinflation leading indicators appearing, which is great. These, two, these four charts uh, are showing you uh, the same thing using two different indices. This is the S&P 500, large cap stocks. This is the Russell 2000. 2000 biggest companies, 500 biggest companies. The red line is US Treasury bond interest rates inverted. So when the red line goes down, it means interest rates are going up, right? So red line goes down, interest rates going up. What you'll see is that when the red line goes, uh, when interest rates are going up, the red line is going down, the blue line tends to fall. What is the blue line? It's growth stocks versus value stocks. Growth stocks tend to do poorly compared to value stocks when interest rates are going up, which is what we've seen this year. We saw interest rates going up, and guess what? Growth stocks have been hammered. We've already described that earlier with PE, showing you the PE charts for US small caps. They tend to be growthier companies. So what this shows is that when interest rates go down, go up, go up, 
when interest rates go up, growth stocks do poorly. But interest rates might soon be done going up. They certainly won't be going up at the same rate. The US Federal Reserve only said that last week. Jerome Powell came out and said in a Senate hearing, expect interest rates to continue rising, but probably at a slower pace. So we've got a really, I hope you can see the picture I'm painting here. The sort of companies you want to be invested in are companies that grow. Growth companies have been hit the hardest. The PEs have been compressed. When do you want to invest? When PEs are at their low ebb. Historically, they're now at their low ebb. And what do we also know? Well, growth stocks have been less favoured at the moment compared to value stocks because interest rates have been going up, but we're already hearing signals that interest rate rises are going to start to slow. We heard that a couple of months ago in October uh, from, um, from the Reserve Bank of Australia as well. Okay, so the picture that I'm painting is, I've given you a framework, you now know what to do, and believe it or not, right now is a really good time to be doing it. You, know, you need to talk to these guys and say, right, I haven't, this, I've got a stash of cash that I never told you about. <laughs> I've been keeping from you. You thought this was everything. It isn't everything. There's this over here. And what should we do with it? Because I'm suggesting that right now could be a really good time to be sharpening the pencil. I'm not saying go out and buy, because you're not going to be that bold. Uh, but we are, and I have. And I wrote about that in my, you know, those of you who follow the articles that I write in the Australian every fortnight, I told everybody in Australia basically who reads that article. I put more money in in June uh, into funds, into equity funds, and I put some more in uh, a few weeks ago as well. Okay, but which companies should we be investing in? Well, I said growthy stocks were hit the hardest. These are the really growthy stocks. These are the growthy stocks you don't want to invest in. These are the companies that didn't make any money, and they fell a lot. You know, I wrote an article about Peloton, in the Oz. Peloton is a company that sells stationary exercise bikes, but they're special. Not like old stationary exercise bikes. These are special. They're connected to the internet. They've got an integrated iPad in them, and you can connect up with other people on a stationary bike elsewhere in the world and join a guy doing a stationary bike exercise class in New York or in Brazil. And you can just type in the, the lesson you want to join and you'll be listening to a guy in Brazil do a cycling lesson and uh, you could be in the comfort of your home uh, in Melbourne while it's raining outside, which it's invariably doing uh, in Melbourne. Don't, I, my family, I'm qualified to say that because I grew up here. I went to Campbell Grammar. I'm a blue blood Melburnian. Um, and... Uh, you know, you can hook up with all these people. You can do the Tour de France on this exercise bike. Doesn't that sound compelling? Am I not selling it enough for you? <laughs> During the pandemic, this company listed, Peloton listed, with a, a, a market valuation of more than 10 billion US dollars. More than 10 billion dollars. And they, just, they didn't make any money. They weren't making a profit, by the way. They had about 500 million dollars of revenue. 500 million, but they were, they were valued at over $10 billion. It's extraordinary. And it was an exercise bike. The, the catchphrase underneath the logo is together we'll go far. How is that possible on a, stra on a, a stationary <laughs> bike? I'm not sure. Anyway, but the funny part of the story, the funny part of the story is that people had forgotten that the exercise industry through history the exercise industry is just about fads. It's, I was only reading on the weekend an article about F45. You know, F45 has collapsed. Its share price has gone from $20 a share to $2.50 a share or something like that. Mark Wahlberg, who was one of the founding investors, he sold out in the IPO, um, you know, or some, sold some of his shares out in the IPO. So you know, the, the exercise, the Peloton bike of today is the ab blaster of a few decades ago. You know, and in the article that I wrote, um, I said that. You know, I said I can remember my mum doing exercise in the lounge room to, um, who was it, Richard Simmons. Remember Richard Simmons? And before that, Jane Fonda. 
Remember Jane Fonda doing the aerobics? It's fad to fad to fad to fad that the entire exercise industry is all about fads. And Peloton was going to be no different. Its share price fell 92.5%. Now at the high, if I'd told you, if I'd stood here and we're at the peak of the market and I said, look, some of these companies are gonna fall 95%, you would have thought, nah, that's extreme. You're just trying to get a headline. You know, that, but there it is for you. So these are the, this is what's happened to growth stocks. And this is the really pointy end of the growth stock story. We're not interested in those kinds of companies. We're interested in companies like REA Group. They're growing their revenue and their earnings every single year and growing their earnings at double digit rates. The blue line that you can see there is analysts' earnings estimates. So this is consensus estimates of earnings. And what you can see, the company, its result comes out, the earnings spike and then analysts start to revise down their earnings again. Then the company beats expectations and analysts start to revise down the earnings. Then it beats expectations. So every one of these spikes is essentially the company beating analyst expectations. And there you can see the G, uh, not the GFC, COVID, and analyst expectations plunged, and then they started putting them back up again. Because what did people buy during COVID? Peloton bicycles, because they thought they'd always exercise in their lounge room. They would never go out again. And I remember, by the way, just as an aside, I remember a journalist calling me, I was working from home. Of course, we all were working from home. Um, and a journalist called and said, do you think that this is the end of the office? And I said, are you kidding? <laughs> My response was, are you joking? Well, what do you mean? We could be working at home now. This is going to be a transformative. We're going to be forced to work at home forever. And then even after that, people will prefer to work at home. <coughs> and I said, look, it's novel now. It's all exciting and you know, don't have to travel to work and it's efficient and everything. But I promise you, Give it a year or two years or however long it takes, I think I said six months to a year, people will be climbing the walls, murder rates will go up, <laughs> um, you know, domestic violence will go up, and it did, uh, and uh, people want to get out of the house. And that's exactly what's happening. People also bought property. They bought a lot of property. So when analysts were reducing their earnings estimates, listings were going up and the company was earning more because there were more houses available for sale. Turnover started going up. Yet, despite the fact that this is a consistent, high-quality, growing company, it dominates Australia's real estate market by a long, long way. There are actually 83 websites in Australia offering you the ability or inviting you to list your house for sale. 79 of them allow you to do it for free. Now, imagine owning a business. We start a business together. Imagine starting a business... Your, one of your questions would be, what is the worst thing that someone could do to us? They could launch a similar product at a cheaper price. REA has 79 competitors offering the same thing at a cheaper price. REA charges the most, and despite charging the most, they have the most listings and earn the most revenue and have more people visiting their website than any other website in Australia. Now, if that isn't the definition of a high-quality business, a business that you would love to own, I don't know what is. And yet its share price fell by almost 50% during the sell-off earlier this year. It's bounced. Uh, we bought some uh, around $100 or about $90, $98 at the time. It then bounced to about $136. It's come back off, uh, I think it's about $112 now. I want to say, Dave, you could check for me. 112 or is 121? Could be 121. I know there's a two and a one in there somewhere. Um, okay, so that's one example. Another example, just shout out the price when you've got it, Dave. Um, IDP Education, another business that suffered during lockdowns, um, or the perception was that it would suffer during lockdown. What does it do? It runs a test called the IELTS. 127. 127. Um, so it runs, thanks Dave, so it runs, uh, it runs the IELTS, which is the International English Language Testing Program. So if you want to get a visa in an English language speaking country, particularly Australia, New Zealand, the UK and Canada, um, then, or you want to get a job, a working visa or a student visa, you have to show a minimum competency in English uh, and you have to sit the IELTS. These guys basically have a 60% market share in the IELTS globally. They also dominate 
the global market for university placements in English-speaking countries, with the exception of the United States. Their biggest market is India. Uh, and that's because India doesn't have or never had the one-child policy, which China got rid of in 2015, uh, but it's still affecting their population. They still have a net negative population, uh, working age population. Um, whereas in India, there's no limit on how many children you can have, but there is a limit on how, mu how many children you can financially support. And so Indian families are huge promoters of sending their kids overseas to study, live and work. And so that is one of the biggest growth markets for IDP education. And guess what? They've just bought out their competitor and partner who were competing with them on price. And now they can raise their prices. They bought out their competitor. They can lift the prices. India was the lowest margin business for IDP education globally. Uh, and I think it, they'll bring, they only need to bring that up to a similar margin to elsewhere in the world. And all of that drops straight to the bottom line. And you can see that's why analysts revised up their earnings after COVID. They not only, not only that, but during COVID, when they weren't placing students, students were still studying online. And so IDP surprised in analysts uh, with positive earnings. Everyone thought they were going to lose money and they announced positive earnings. A global example, uh, Adobe. Um, and what I, the point I wanted to make there, that share price also almost fell uh, by 50% uh, during that sell-off. Remember, buy when the day is darkest. You really want to buy high quality businesses when those PEs get compressed as much as they did recently. This is Adobe. This is one where the PE hasn't recovered very much at all. Adobe dominates the world in creative suite software. So PDF, uh, this presentation is being brought to you by Adobe. <laughs> Literally, it's on PDF. Um, Adobe Photoshop, those of you who use Instagram and you, you, you always look much more handsome and more beautiful on Instagram than in real life, and that's thanks to uh, Photoshop uh, or software that, you know, that, that makes an image look a lot better than it did in reality. So share price started coming off earlier this year when the company announced that it would not collect any revenue from its subscribers in Russia. It would not charge its subscribers in the Ukraine and it would not sell any new subscriptions into Russia. Share price started coming off uh, and it continued to fall along with the PE compression in growth stocks in the US as interest rates kept going up. So that share price now has gone from 700 and I think, Dave, you can look it up as well. I think it's actually, uh, it might be slightly lower than this now, uh, but that was updated a few weeks ago. Uh, but you can see significant, more than 50% fall in the share price. And this is a company that is still expanding significantly overseas in terms of geo new geographies and also in terms of the market, existing markets and its penetration rate into existing markets. What's the price? 341. 341, so it's actually bounced now. So it wouldn't have been good if it was 299 today. You could have rushed out, bought it, and then tomorrow it would be 341. Um, Okay, so I'm going to continue presenting these slides as the market goes up and down. We might get another sell-off. We may get another sell-off early next year. I, I don't know. But if we do, at least you have some names to think about and a framework to navigate with. Okay, some more encouragement. Over on the right-hand side here, each one of these columns is stacked with a year. There's a particular year. And down the bottom here, we have minus 40%, minus 30%, minus 20% to zero, zero to 10%, that's the zero to 10% column. This tallest one is the 10% to 20% column. And each of those years is a year that the S&P 500 generated a return of between 10 and 20%. This, bar, this column over here on the far left-hand side, 1931. That was, a, that was the year that the market fell by more than 40%. The next two, 1937, 2008, the market fell between minus 30 and minus 40%. Bad years. But one of the observations that we can make about this is that most of the time, most years, the market rises by 10 to 20%. Most of the time. And in fact, the bulk is 0 to 30%. That's that area there. So more years than any other, 
the market goes from zero to 30% up most years. That should give you some encouragement. The other observation that's probably less obvious is 1931 was followed two years later by 1933. So the market went down by more than 40%, and the, the year after, I think it went down by 10. 1932 is in this column here somewhere, but then the year after that, the market went up by more than 50%. The second, in the second worst years, 1937 was followed by 1938. 2008 was followed by 2009. So really, really bad years are often followed by quite good years or really good years. And that red there is 2022 to the end of last month. So we've had a really bad year in the US stock market. Who knows? I'm not predicting. But history suggests that we could get, if not next year, the year after or the year after that, a very, very good year, which takes us back to that PE chart. Remember that PE chart and how much they change around? And remember our framework? If we buy in a low PE at some point in the next five years, PEs could go up again. This is suggesting they probably will. Okay. Sentiment earlier in the year was at a really low ebb. In fact... This is, a, this is a, from the US, the American Association of Individual Investors, and you can Google these guys, and every week they update this chart. And what it shows is they survey their members for who's bearish and who's bullish and who's neutral and so on. And then they map that, they plot that. And what we can see is that if we go back to, uh, let's say, uh, October, we had 56% bearish, okay, 56. And then um, uh, that was the 19th and the 12th, those weeks of the 19th and 12th of October, we had maximum bearishness this year. And the one year historical worst bearishness was 61% or thereabouts. So we've been very, very bearish just recently. And that tends to be <coughs> a contrarian indicator. When investors are most bearish, that's probably when PEs are the lowest, and therefore that's probably the time to take an interest. Remember what Buffett said, be greedy when others are fearful. So back, back not that long ago, people were maximum fearful. Okay, this final chart I'm going to show you before I leave you with a, a tip um, to invest successfully in the Australian market um, is... Uh, from BT, and what they show is the bear markets followed by the bull markets going back to 1940. So the dark blue lines that you can see there are the bear markets and how long they lasted, and the light blue lines you can see are the bull markets and how long they lasted. Now what you'll notice is the bull markets, and probably the most important observation from this chart, is the bull markets tend to last longer. They go on for longer. So if you wait before investing, you still have an opportunity to get in. You haven't Just because you didn't get in on the ground floor doesn't mean you're not going to do okay. What I wouldn't take away from this is that you always make money because even after the market has risen 559%, it then fell 46. <laughs> Once you gave half of that back in that next little bear market, but it doesn't last as long as the bull markets. So I think we're somewhere near a low ebb in the market. And I know there's lots of reasons to be fearful, but the suite of evidence that I've presented today hopefully gives you the same conclusion that it gave me when I first absor absorbed it. And that was that, you know what, I need to be putting some more money in the market. And that's what I've been doing recently and writing about it in the Oz as I do it. Okay, so to finish off, a couple of things. Equities have suffered, we know that. Yes, it, the economy is weak, and yes, we could get a recession next year. We could. But what I also know is that PEs tend to reach their low point at the beginning of a recession, not at the end of the recession. So the worst sentiment tends to be before the recession begins. Then when the recession hits, everyone says, that's not as bad as I thought. You know, often the fear of the, the, fear of the thing is worse than the thing itself. Um, and a couple of others, um, you've heard the phrase time versus timing. Um, time is the friend of an extraordinary business.
People often say, look, it's time in the market, not timing the market that's important. I agree with that. But time, if you spend a long time in a bad business, owning a bad business, it's not gonna be good for you, right? Owning a rubbish business for a long period of time is gonna be financially disastrous. More time in a business like that is bad, not good. So yes, time is important, but time spent in businesses that are growing, in high quality businesses that have a competitive edge like REA or Adobe, those sorts of businesses, you know, Yeti maybe, or Tooley, you know, those are the sorts of businesses uh, that we want to own. Businesses that are growing, have a competitive advantage, staying in those for a long period of time, getting into those when PEs are compressed and sentiment is negative, that's going to work out okay. Uh, and then of course, whether interest rates rise or fall doesn't really affect private credit funds like the Aura Fund that I was talking about earlier. Okay, that's it for the presentation, but what I wanted to do was give you a couple of bonus slides, and I hope you don't mind. Um, many, many years ago, uh, a fund manager who's now retired, he said to me, this is close to 30 years ago, he said, Roger, there's a really simple way to make money in the Australian stock market. Of course, I was all ears. 30 years ago, still all ears today, still want to learn, still want to find out more. Um, he said this, he said, just buy a really great retail concept early in the store rollout story. Okay, get into the IPO when the company floats uh, and as long as you believe and it continues to be a good retail concept, as they expand their store footprint, earnings will go up and the share price will take care of itself. So I've got three examples of that to show you. And I've got quotes from their um, PDS, from their uh, IPO, their prospectus. Um, so in Levisa's case, they listed in 2014, they listed at $2 a share. The market cap at the time was $210 million. They had 220 stores. Two years earlier, in 2012, they only had 60 stores. So it went from 60 to 220, already showing you evidence of them, their plan to grow stores. And what did they say in their prospectus? We're embarking upon the fastest specialty store expansion ever seen globally. And that prospectus quote was taken out by Jeweler Magazine and quoted on October 23rd, 2014. So they were, they were doing precisely what that, that fund manager told me 30 years ago uh, to look for. Today, $24.45 a share, up from $2 a share, market cap 2.6 billion, 449 stores. So that is a very high double digit rate of return. Another example, JB Hi-Fi. Um, I remember as a kid, used to go down to Peter Stevens, loved motorbikes as a kid, and my mum would allow my brother and I to hop on a tram and go down to Elizabeth Street to where all the motorbike shops were, and we'd go into the Peter Stevens store and look at the Kawasaki's and the Hondas, and we just loved drooling. We we're never going to be able to afford one, but we just liked looking at the bikes. And then I remember a JB Hi-Fi store opening up on Elizabeth Street in amongst all the motorbike shops. And, and you might remember that store, they just sold vinyl albums. That's all they sold. They were, they were the go-to destination for vinyl albums. If you were a collector of music, you loved music, that's where you went. Then they transformed from albums to CDs, then DVDs, and now appliances. They've done a great job. They listed in 2003 at $1.55 with just 25 Australian stores. Market cap was 158. What did they say in their prospectus? From here it is about making sure we open new stores according to plan. Find a, a great retail concept that plans on opening a lot of stores and you'll do just fine. Today, $24.45 up from $1.55, market cap of over 3 billion stores, now 316 stores, in, including um, Clive Anthony uh, and um, what's the other one? Um, good guys. Good guys, thank you. Good guys. Nick Scarley is the last example. Um, they said in their prospectus the company will continue to seek new opportunities to add further stores. Great retail concept. <laughs> um, Anthony Scarley's uh, Anthony Scarley is the son of Nick Scarley, and Anthony Scarley invented the thing that frustrates us so much when we buy furniture. He was the one who brought that concept to Australia. You know when you walk, remember the old days when you used to walk into a furniture store, you say, I'll take that one. And they say, you yeah, bring your car around and your trailer and we'll, we've got one in the warehouse for you, we'll put it on the trailer for you, you can take it home. 
or we'll deliver it for you straight away. Now what happens? You go to a furniture store, you say, I really like that couch. And they say, yep, that'll be 12 weeks, please pay now. And you have to wait for it. The Scully family invented that idea. No inventory, no stock. Cash in the door, a deposit paid, a large deposit paid, and you have to wait for your couch. And it's never stored, it's brought to Australia and it's delivered to you. So really profitable. Um, listed in 2004, $81 million market cap. I think in their first year of listed, when they listed in their first year, they made $6.7 million profit. I think that was their total profit. They had 10 stores. Now got 175 stores, market cap, $759 million, share price nine times what it was when it listed. So that was not part of my plan last week to present to you, but I'd written about it and I thought, you know what, I'm gonna share it with you guys. If you see an IPO next year, doesn't matter if interest rates are going up, down, sideways, doesn't matter what inflation's doing, don't worry about what Xi is doing in China, don't worry about what Trump does in the United States, don't worry about any of that. If it's an IPO for a great retail concept and they're talking about growing their store count significantly over the years, find out about how you can get some stock. That's the, the responsibility of these guys to do that for you. And hopefully they can. Um, that's it for today, and I'll, uh, I'm happy to take some questions. Just on those three examples, how, yes. would, you, how would you classify boost juice? Um, well, Retail Zoo is not just boost juice. So Retail Zoo also has Betty's Burgers, I believe, and it's got a few other concepts in there as well. So you'd have to work out what the store growth is going to be. Um, if the IPO says we're planning on, you know, we've got a thousand stores, and we're going to grow by 10 this year, then arguably that's not sufficient sort of growth. But if they're saying, look, we've got a thousand stores and we're gonna be 2000 stores in two years time, well, then you go, then you say, yeah, I'm, I'm all for that. And if you see queues out the front of Betty's Burgers and outside Boost Juice, you know, then it's a great retail concept. Boost Juice is a great retail concept. You know, there's still people queuing up. In fact, at the airport this morning, I saw a dad with his two kids, the three of them had Boost Juice. You know, they were, very happily having a juice, a, a, a smoothie that was more energy than they need for the rest of the week. Um, <laughs> they're happy to do it. Yeah, so great retail concept. Yes. Any other questions? Any more questions? Canva. Canva doesn't make a profit as far as I'm aware. Yeah, I don't, it's not my, that's not my wheelhouse understanding which of the profitless prosperity companies are going to do are going to be around i just don't know i did write earlier this year that we're going to see lots of unemployment coming from the venture capital taps being turned off so a lot of these profitless companies how do they how do they support their headcount they support it through the altruism of investors private equity investors and venture capital investors if the appetite to fund those loss-making businesses dries up, or the tap is turned slightly slower, then people lose their jobs. And these businesses, their growth aspirations slow down, and the focus goes from growth to survival. Uh, and that's what we're seeing right now. We're seeing headcount at Tesla, um, Amazon, uh, uh, Meta. sorry? Meta. Twitter, Twitter, Meta, Facebook. Um, yeah, all of those businesses. Uh, a, a stripping headcount um, because uh, not in the case of some of them like some of them are profitable like Meta for example highly profitable but the loss making businesses if they don't get money in the door to fund the salaries they have to let people go and so I think for a lot of these businesses and Canva might not be profitable um, I'm pretty sure it's not uh, then their focus right now might be not on growth as much as it was in the past I don't know do you have an interest in Canva? no no Roger, is there any, do uh, you cover Life360 at all? I use Life360. We once had an investment in it, but it was only for a very short period of time. Why do you ask? Oh, I've just been reading it. It's been, it's a lot of people that seem to be using it. Yeah, I, I don't know why, because I have an Apple phone and my wife insists on Life360, so we have it. Yes. But I keep showing her that Find My Phone if we just put my daughter's phone on Find My Phone, it's the same thing. Yeah. We just got one of those air tags for our dog. He's an escape artist. Um, the neighbours are always ringing us to say, we've got your dog. 
Um, he's a great dog. He just loves to go and visit his girlfriends down the road. Um, and, uh, and so we've now put a, a tag on him. I don't need Life360 to track him. I can see on my phone where he is. In fact, I could check it now. And uh, hopefully he's at home. <laughs> yeah. Yep. I was just going to ask about CSL. Yeah. Can you see it from a growth perspective? Yeah, it, it, uh, Sean and Alan and Dan have owned CSL since day one. They've owned it for 17 years. I've always classed it as one of the nine businesses in Australia that are, are unassailable in terms of their quality. Uh, yeah, they're an incredible group of businesses. Cochlear is another one, REA is another one. Um, so uh, ARB, Reese, you know, there's two more uh, in that group of nine companies. And CSL is just a phenomenal business. I don't think of it as a fractioning blood plasma business. I actually think of it as a mining company. <laughs> yeah, it's actually a mining business. It mines blood. And in the US it has to pay for it. But in Australia, you, you, you give them the, the raw material for free and you get a cookie and maybe an ice cream if you're lucky. You know, and that's it. It's an incredible business. And the pipeline of developments that they've got and you know, the realisation as more and more, uh, more and more research discovers that the power to heal ourselves is within ourselves, um, that's, that's an incredible thing for that business. You know, it's going to be around in 100 years. It's going to be around longer than my new slate roof. <laughs> Which is guaranteed for a hundred years. <laughs> yeah. uh, yes. Lithium shares. I'll come back to you and say. Lithium. lithium shares. Yeah. So lithium, we we had a big investment in our small cap uh, fund in lithium, uh, and did very very well out of it. What we think most more recently is that a lot of the good news is now priced in, and we think that it's still a great long term story. Uh, and we think that there'll be an opportunity to buy these companies at a cheaper price again. That's the thesis in a nutshell at the moment. So we've like, we only bought producers, we didn't buy the explorers, we wanted to reduce the risk, uh, so we did really well owning lithium producers, um, both spodumene and, and hard, uh, and, um, but we're not, we're not big owners of lithium at the moment, we just think it's all in the price, yeah. I have a similar sort of question about your view with all the Australian companies supplying for the EV market. Yeah. Like, you know, what phase do you think we're at? I think the story's known. So that, you know, that the, the, that period in a thesis, in an investment thesis where everyone's just catching on to the story, that's done. Everyone's caught on to the story now. And that's why I'm saying that we think that story's in the price. Um, don't rule out don't rule out the businesses involved in non-electric cars because the majority of the fleet of Australian cars will be internal combustion engine for another quarter of a century, at least. You know, you, you think about it, we've got, we sell a million cars a year and that grows at about two or 3% per annum. Now last year, only three to 5% or maybe it was five to 10%, we're uh, not even 10% were electric, pure electric cars. So we're not replacing the fleet with electric cars at any great rate, right? So if you continue, and I think there's, I'm trying to remember how many cars are in Australia, how big the fleet actually is. I think it's 18 million cars. Don't quote me on that. I think it's 18 million. So you've got 18 million, you've got a million new cars being sold every year. And of that, about 700,000 replace existing cars. And electric is a tiny fraction of that. So when you just run the math, in, just run the formula in a spreadsheet, you get out to 25 years and you still haven't replaced the fleet, not even close. So businesses like um, Waypoint, which is a real estate investment trust that owns petrol stations. Sometimes their share price suffers, their unit price suffers, and the yield becomes really attractive because people say, oh, no one's going to need petrol stations anymore. Everyone's moving to electric. Well, yeah, they are, but it's going to take a long time. And for that reason, that's an opportunity. You know, and businesses like BAPCOR. You know, BAPCOR are servicing, they're providing the parts for mechanics to service internal combustion engine cars. Right? And people say people, the share price collapses from time to time because people say, oh, Electric cars don't need as much maintenance. Mechanics don't have to fix them. 
you know, you can drive and someone will pop up and say, yeah, I've got a Tesla, I've had it for four years and I've never had to take it for a repair. But then someone else says, yeah, no, mine's, my Tesla's never worked. Um, so, uh, so, you know, they'll be repairing internal combustion engines for a long, long time. So those rare opportunities where people just get really excited about electric and think it's all gonna happen immediately, take advantage of that in a different way by looking for the, who, who, who do all these acolytes and advocates think the losers are? Because often in that rubble, you'll find a terrific investment opportunity. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Oh, sorry, just oh, one sorry. sec, over yeah. the back. Do, do you see the, um uh, effects of the government legislation to uh, cap gas and uh, coal pricing profits affecting lights of Whitehaven and New Hall. Yeah. Um, it depends. We still don't know the outcome. No. Uh, next year, we don't know what the outcome is going to be. My understanding is the federal government is talking to the New South Wales and Queensland premiers right now um, to decide on whether or not uh, gas prices, for example, are capped. Um, and that's just one byproduct right so it, it is a moving feast at the moment and so my view is that there's too many moving parts and it's very very hard to know uh, with clarity what the future holds now there are others out there who are saying all resources are going to be in a sustained boom for a long time and partly because of esg for example so all of the money that's being pulled out of funding these fossil fuel businesses is actually means that the value of the commodity stays higher for longer because less new supply is being found because less new supply is being funded. The exploration is not being funded because of environmental and, and um, social and governance requirements by many investors now. Um, but again, much like the EV story, there'll be opportunities there. When they're priced as if they're going out of business, if you determine that they're not, then that's a fantastic investment opportunity. I didn't show, point this out. Look at this over here. And this is to, to the point I just made. Uh, that one, uh, REA. That moved from $96 to $138 or thereabouts. Yeah, that's a 40% move in the share price just there, just in a few weeks. So that, when I was said to you, you know, if, it, if it's being priced as if it's going out of business, mm -hmm but it isn't, that kind of thing can happen very, very quickly, particularly in commodities. Yeah. Now, I know that's not a specific answer um, to two particular companies that you named, and that's because I'd rather not say what I think about those two companies. It's political dynamite. Um, okay, question up here. I was just going to ask, given the volatility in building products and materials over the last sort of 12 months, 18 months, yep. how do you see something like Bunnings? Yeah, so, so a lot of... Bunnings is a phenomenal business, right? absolutely amazing business. Um, I like the trust too, the Bunnings Warehouse Property Trust as well. Lots of land and a tin shed on top. Mm. Lots of appreciating asset, mm. lots of appreciating asset and not much depreciating asset. Whereas an office building, the opposite, just as an aside, office building, not much land going up, but a big building going down, right? Mm. Uh, so yeah, so like both businesses. Um, Interestingly, you know, Bunnings is part of West Farmers, and West Par Farmers is also a lithium business, and it's also, you know, it's got a lot of different strings to its bow. The Bunnings business itself is, is there's a cycle related to renovations and additions demand, uh, and that's slowing down now. Uh, and that's slowing down because it's a function of turnover of properties. And if turnover of property slows and it's slumped, uh, it's fallen by 18 or 20 percent just in the last few months. Um, if turnover has slumped, then you know 10 months later there'll also be less renovation demand. Uh, and so there's a you know, there's a lag of 10 months between buying a property and renovating it. Um, we know that we've seen that many many times. Uh, and so now we're seeing a slump in turnover. Therefore, there'll be a decline in renovations. To some extent, that's going to hit Bunnings. Yeah. Yep. You, you mentioned your <coughs> United States colleagues have a fund of about 850 billion. No, 83 billion. 
Oh, sorry, 83 billion. It'd be great if it was 850 billion. <laughs> well, yes and no. My question is, at what stage does a fund get too big? Well, there are funds with trillions. Um, so, you know, that over time, that number will always get bigger because over time, cap the way capitalism works, uh, aside from, aside from uh, uh, funneling the money to the few, which it does if it's unregulated, um, the values of things go up. Inflation ensures that is going to happen. Uh, and so while 83 billion might seem big now, in 10 years time, it won't be. Uh, and so I don't know what the right number is. And, and the reason why it's really hard to answer is because it's going to keep growing. Yeah. 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 Okay. Well, we might be done. Thank you very much for coming. Yeah. I just wanted to say thank you for those questions because it mm. does make it interesting for me. I prepare these slides mm. so I know what I'm going to say before I even say it. Um, and I know what I want to talk about. So it's kind of predictable for me. Your questions make it really, really interesting for me and make it worth giving the presentation. So thank you again. Thanks very much. Thank you.